Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, sorry for a bit of a delay. You know that early morning sessions are usually like this. But if, uh, is my voice coming clear? Yes. So, uh, fantastic. So my name is Walid al Sakaf. Uh, I'll be moderating the session today. And I uh, would like to note that the session will deal with two ris rather interesting subjects, face fake news and blockchain technology. <clears throat> In this respect, I'd like to note that this is a rather emerging technology. So we don't expect to give you solutions. And we don't expect to give you recipes for how to solve the fake news problem. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Um, but we'll have inspiration, I would say. Inspiration, some ideas from the youth. I believe the young have a very important role to play. They are the ones leading the future innovations in this field. They are the ones who will hold the future. Whether it's uh, going to be bright or not, this is <laughs> the moment to decide. They will be the ones holding uh, the uh, let's say torch after this generation. So I'd say this is more of a, a future-oriented session. And it, it will be uh, looking into the subject from different perspectives. Uh, we'll be having a more interactive session than usual since we have only three speakers, so we'll give much more time for the floor and to uh, remote moderators. First, let me give you an introduction of why this is important. <coughs> Fake news, as you know, it, it's uh, no secret. It's become one of the trendiest subjects of today's discussions around internet governance. <coughs> it's, have, it's had and it continues to have uh, uh, negative repercussions on the trust of the public in the, on the internet. It makes uh, readers somewhat concerned that what they read might not be factual. And this leads to uh, some hesitation in uh, being, feeling that they are informed. Furthermore, this also damages the reputation of uh, news media particularly those that are online. I personally come from an academic background. I uh, teach at Sudetern University in the area of journalism and media technology. And one of the interesting works that uh, projects we work on is uh, how to help journalists overcome or let's say deal with the proliferation of fake news, particularly with the rise of social media. And uh, so one of the w things that we've been uh, considering is using technology. And I think this is a perfect match of, uh, that we could uh, relate to in our own daily job. Uh, it will not be a, a purely technical solution. Uh, it will have to res rely on the people working in this field, both as on journalists, on media organizations, as well as end users. Additionally, b blockchain is, is still a tool it's been built by humans, and so it has the flaws of humans, and it also ha will be used by humans, so it depends on the end uh, user often that the biggest, uh, critical, weakest point is often the end user, and that's why it's important to see this as not a utopian solution, but as a tool for uh, perhaps helping uh, the uh, users and those involved in news uh, be more uh, informed of how to use this technology. So uh, it's said enough. I'll be probably intervening once in a while if there are no questions. But then I'll just uh, begin by introducing the speakers and having them introduce their subjects. As we said, we don't have a long list. We originally had 11, but now it's dropped to uh, three. <laughs> but we already uh, we have high expectations of you, the audience, to help us out. and introduce both your comments or bring your questions. So uh, I'd like to start. I'll be starting with Nadia, who is the young uh, uh, leader in her field in IG. She is at the steering committee of the Young uh, Coalition, Youth Coalition on Internet Governance and in the U Young European Leadership. So I'd like to give her the floor and so she can lead the discussion. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank uh, Young Netherlands IGF and the Netherlands IGF for this wonderful opportunity and also my fellow panelists and our moderator. The problem what I have with um, answering the question, what is considered fake news? 
to recognize what it is, we need to know what exactly it is. Uh, this has been also a topic over the last few days in, in different panels of what do we consider to be fake news, what is exactly included with it to be able to understand how we deal with it. So I follow uh, the framework that was set up by Claire Wardle from First Draft News, who also wrote the report by the Council of Europe about um, fake news, specifically focusing um, that fake news addresses the information disorder that we face uh, today that encompasses a lot of different items, including echo uh, chambers, uh, uh, filter bubbles. But she specifically said that there are three uh, themes within fake news. We look at misinformation, false information that's being shared, but no harm is actually meant with it. We talk about disinformation, which is the most popular one heard uh, in the media, which is false information with the intent to cause harm. But there's also the little known malinformation, which is actual real genuine information that's being shared to cause harm. And that's often kind of private things that people don't want you to know that's being shared to cause uh, harm into the public sphere. So you can see there, there are three strands. So what would we then need to teach if we talked about overcoming um, fake news? If we do fact checking, fact checking is limited only to misinformation and disinformation uh, because it's ensuring to ins that we have all the facts correct. If we look at source inf uh, verification, we see that it's important to all three. But then we enter the discussion on trust and we talk about reputation. And then what I have seen little in the discussions yet is we talk about critical thinking. Critical thinking depends on how widely first reading an individual is exposed to. Because perhaps the information that's shared might be genuine, but the interpretation of the share then creates the problem. So rather than saying and wondering whether we are, we, we have to tackle fake news and, and we are responsible for doing this, I would prefer saying that we need to engage with information in an informed manner. So it, in this way, we promote the notion of critically reflecting upon information that is being received, whether this is fact checking, um, so you doubt the validity, or you do source verification, so you understand the background and the context, whether that be a, col a cultural or a political line. And also critical thinking, to diversify and extend your knowledge encouraging people to ensure that you are widely read so that you can encounter different sources to engage with and thus better understand the topic and point out any inconsistencies that we might need to challenge. So this is where I would like to start and I would love to hear uh, further from the rest of the panels. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Um, it looks like we'll have lots of time for the, panel, for the <coughs> participants. Thank you for a brief and uh, concrete and focused statement. Uh, so moving on, uh, we'll be dealing, uh, let's say, we'll have uh, Krishna Kumar, who will be giving us his perspective on this from perhaps a civil, so civil society uh, angle. Uh, he has been uh, active in this field through the Internet Society Chennai chapter, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alan, for the opportunity, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, so the way I look at it is um, from two points. One is technology and the other is people because we all know that technology is essential for taking the society forward, for advancement of the society. But what we are witnessing now is with the growth in technology, there is a huge growth in the complexities as well, in the way the society functions and in the way people interact with each other, and which has led to other misleading things such as fake news. So what I'm interested and curious about is how we bridge this gap between technology and people and create an environment that is conducive to growth. And uh, so, and, and I feel this topic is very essential because um, how do we make people use technology in a way that they don't misuse it? And with respect to blockchain, it has its advan advantages and disadvantages. And also, a lot of people don't understand blockchain. So what are we going to do about it if we are going to ha ha tackle fake news uh, through blockchain? And these are all um, the information that I'm uh, willing to talk about and discuss on here. Thank you. 
thank you, Krishna. Uh, we'll also be dealing with blockchain. I'll be giving an introduction on what it means and how it can help from a perspective that's more or less, more or less technical, but also uh, is generally informing. Um, now, pass on the uh, torch to uh, Yolanda, who is uh, at the Emerging Leaders in uh, Internet Governance of South Africa. And so the floor is yours. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for making it time and waking up early. So when I was first um, approached to speak on this session, I was very worried because I'm not really sure what fake news is. Oh, okay. So I'm not really sure what fake news is because what might be fake to you might be my opinion. Um, and I also believe that the issue of fake news is not a new issue. So when newspapers came out, people were worried, saying, oh, propaganda, or oh, we will be misinformed. So um, as much as this may seem new, it's not a new thing at all. And when I look back in terms of like media scholars, uh, scholars like John Mill always uh, sort of advocated for freedom of the press, for example, that we need diverse views, as many views as possible, and it is, and it is up to the public to decipher what the truth is. And I think um, even, in the in, in the, even in the world of the internet, uh, there's so much information out there, and I do believe in a plurality of views, and it should be, up, it should be open enough for people to decipher what the truth is. Um, my former speakers have mentioned that we could use technology to decipher truth, or at least to say, this is a valid source. But at the same token, um, those algorithms, as the moderator said, are created by humans. Therefore, in, an, in, in themselves, they are biased. Uh, furthermore, the issue of fake news in terms of the internet as well is very worrying to me. So sometimes we, we tend to believe that because traditional media like your BBC or CNN are traditional, therefore they are valid news, but who's to say they really are? Um, so in a nutshell, you know, I've been struggling with this, com with this topic of fake news because there's no clear definition of what fake news is. Um, and therefore, when we talk about solutions, I really would like to caution against filtering content or at least check or at least labeling content as fake or not because sometimes agendas might be pushed along through that way by um, trivializing certain opinions or views because it does not seem to agree with the dominant view, especially coming from Africa where freedom of expression is not a widely accessible thing. We worry that if content is filtered or labeled as fake, it actually might work towards stifling freedom of expression and access to information. So I think um, as much as this topic might seem new, it really isn't because as a person who is involved in media and journalism, you'll find that this conversation is not so different from when newspapers came out. And I think that is basically what I have to say for now. And as the conversation goes on, I'd like to hear more. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yolanda. As you can see now, we have finished the first set of presentations to allow you, to the audience, to give your perspectives and comments and uh, questions. Please introduce yourself and, and continue, please. Okay, my name is Boris Engelson. I am a, a local journalist freelance. It is very rare that I address thanks to a panel, but I am amazed because you create an atmosphere of interaction from the first syllable you pronounce, and the three speakers said more in three minutes than most experts in three hours in similar. No, I am not joking. And uh, uh, so this is really, a, after 10 minutes, I can say an exceptional uh, workshop. Um, I, as a practicing journalist, I want to make two, at least two remarks. One of you rightly said that one of the issue is not only blatant lies. Blatant lies is actually an old issue and is uh, uh, not specific to electronic media, to, to the web. But critical thinking, uh, fi facts would, would be okay, but interpretation not. I can give you some very, very simple, basic example, which I uh, experience 
lately. We have, in, here in Switzerland, we are the most democratic country. And our radio TV, official radio TV, is the most objective, trustful uh, ever. Some time ago, there was a, a documentary on Greece and the in depthness of Greece. And of course, in Greece, there are mass uh, suicides because of these naughty foreign banks, etc. So they gave the figures. I went to check the figure. I saw that the mass suicide rate was lower than the normal rate in Switzerland. So I wrote to the committee supposed to protect the uh, truthfulness of information and convey complaints of viewers. They said, okay, we'll pass, we'll answer you. It's already one or two years, I never got it. And why do I take this minute example? It might sound ridiculous, because if you check quality media, you will find every day thousands of such instances. But of course, who would be willing to look as, uh, like a reactionary uh, journalist challenging the idea that the naughty foreign member, etc. So nobody would, and this kind of tiny, it's not even lies, it's stances, so that the public will think, oh, we have a TV protecting the people of the world. This happens every day, every second, every sentence, even in the best. And I wanted to make another remark on the newspaper Le Monde, but I talk already too much, so I might make that contribution in a little while. Thank you very much. I mean, this is really a very good uh, indicator that it's not black and light. It's very difficult to say, okay, something is fake news because uh, it has no, no factual information or it has factual information. Sometimes the context, the environment, the ecosystem. And, and the journeys who made that documentary are certain that they made the best documentary and contributing to democracy and truth. So we can say it is very complex. That's, that's the bottom line. Yes, uh, please introduce yourself. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Ingrid Volkma. I'm from the University of Melbourne in Australia, not Maryland, like somebody <laughs> understood yesterday. Um, yeah, I think this is a very Im important and very interesting panel, but I also must say I'm a bit um, surprised that on a conference like this, fake news is so much in the spotlight. I understand that it's a problem, but I think the analysis of what fake news is could be more detailed and could look at other issues. For example, I think, and I agree with you, Landa, and I think that was a terrific uh, contribution you've made, where we had fake news so-called even in traditional journalism. I can recall several instances where CNN combined allegedly images with voice which didn't uh, uh, match in the first place and created uh, fake news. I think it was something about Palestine a, long, a very long time ago, but there are a few instances where even the traditional tr uh, trusted media produced fake news, so-called. Now, in our time, I think we have to realize that public communication is totally changing. And there are major yeah, backbones of these new communication flows, like Facebook, like Google News, like other forms of social media, which are corporations linking our news feeds, linking our algorithm on our uh, websites. And I think these are the larger structures we have to think about too. So on my news feed on, on uh, Facebook, which I know is a very outdated social media site, but I'm still looking at it often, um, you get all sorts of news. How can I, uh, you know, uh, assess if these news are correct or not. And I think to talk about fake news, just is this news right or is that sort of news story wrong, is a bit too scratching on the surface. I think we need to go a bit deeper and understand the, the larger structures under these forms of uh, public communication. And that's uh, what I think we need to look at. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to see if, we, if the audience, uh, the speakers have a re reaction. Of course, they are welcome to respond. Um, sure. Does anyone? Like uh, Nadia, Krishna. Later. Okay. <laughs> okay Nadia, Nadia can. Yes. Now it's. <laughs> Thank you for raising your question. You you raised four interesting topics. So, when we talk about traditional journalism and creating fake news, one thing uh, you talked about the 
uh, how corporations are linking fields. And uh, besides traditional journalism, we shouldn't forget there's also a lot of citizen journalism and organizations that uh, are creating involvement in which citizens contribute news stories live so that you have the latest breaking news that uh, media outlets immediately pick up. So for example, uh, um, Euronews has recently set up Africa News and um, they have a mobile phone app in which um, people on the field can just submit any video and they are just being uh, tracked by GeoTracker and by um, whatever they submit by, uh, by, by the statements that they're, that they're making. So then we rely on citizen journalism. We rely on the individual people on their honesty and trust and then the amount of time that there is available between receiving that message, verifying it, and then producing it leaves uh, traditional journalism a little bit in a pickle because they are in this d developing world not entirely sure how immediately they can fact check and source verify it because if we look at media economics, we have less and less foreign uh, office, foreign specialists in the field. We are sp spending less money. Uh, the protection of journalism is also in a, in a major, major crisis. And uh, last year, the Council of Europe uh, was working on the report to ensure how can we protect journalists who are going into war zones? How can we also protect sources? Because the sources are then scared um, to, to produce materials. So this anonymity on one side is then being used to ensure that we have credible and real life materials so we know what's going on in the field directly rather than rely p uh, possibly on, on messages that are coming from people who, who don't want it, but then shifting through all of these is incredibly difficult. So that's not really an answer to your question, but it is raising the, the issue more prominently that we need to look more in the protection of, of journalists, that we need to focus on um, how are these mobile apps being used and how can we ca guarantee responsibility or um, ensuring that they are reliable um, and um, how can we ensure that uh, citizen uh, contributions are then um, you know, accounted for. We previously spoke about, um, well, I said previously, there were previous discussions about uh, blogs and whether or not there should be a blogger code of conduct. In fact, three were made, but nobody wants to have it because it tackles freedom of speech, that you are uh, holding people accountable who do not want to um, necessarily be accountable because they want to be free in what they feel. Uh, it's a form of, you know, a allowing yourself to have a diary. Thank you, Nadi. I, I, as a moderator, I might want to intervene now and, and bring back the, the topic of blockchain. And I think when you refer to citizen journalism, I think you touched upon something that bl blockchains can be the, I mean, a, a direct resemblance of the potential of how technology can drive citizen journalism. Um, briefly, who in the room knows exactly what blockchains are? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. All right, so maybe I could give a brief introduction of what they are. Blockchains are, in my, my view, or, or what I can, the best description I would say is a reaction to the centralization of power. In a blockchain uh, environment, you have uh, the ability for people, individuals, to take control of their data. Um, technically speaking, it is similar to the way that ledgers are kept. You know, when you go to a bank, and one person, let's say, purchases or deposits money, there is a, at the bank a central entity that records the transaction. This person sent this much uh, to this person. So this information is kept at a ledger on a, in a central bank located somewhere. But in a, a blockchain environment, so uh, this ledger is not kept at a central location. It is kept in identical copies at every single uh, customer or client that is using the servers. So if, if there are 100 clients and each one is interacting with the other, each one will have a direct Im, a copy, immediate, uh, uh, a non-fraudulent copy of the exact ledger, so they are match 100%. It means that there's really no center. The same copy of the same ledger is in existence ev in every single node. So that means that you no longer need a center. And that explains, for example, why many people who are fearful of the intervention of central banks are using blockchain technology to save their, to keep their savings. They don't rely on governments anymore, so they convert their currency, fiat currency, dollars, etc., to cryptocurrency. And that's why blockchains resemble a, a, 
an escape from centralization. So the thing is that that applies to money, but it, it can equally apply to data. It can equally apply to news. And so, for example, right now there is a, a project in civil, that's called civil in New York, that's using uh, the uh, model of blockchain to decentralize news. And it's trying to introduce uh, a new paradigm shift in which you can actually have distributed newsrooms. Another example is Presscoin, based in London, that I encourage you to look it up. It's trying to look into how uh, the uh, in, uh, journalists can build their own portfolios as journalists uh, that are totally independent of any central entity. And that comes back to the question of influence, power. If you have a power that is influencing a journalist to put in propaganda, not necessarily fake news per se, but one directional coverage, biased coverage, then in a system where there is really no power above the journalist, then there is the journalist himself decide or herself deciding on what to do and how to write a particular story. That encourages citizen journalism, but it's not the solution, obviously. It's just one way in eliminating one of the factors that, contr that is centralized control. Uh, there is really no uh, way for an influence, a bigger power, to control what you store on the database. That's just uh, one illustration of how uh, blockchains can contribute. I'm not saying it's definitely one way of the, the right way of doing it, but it's uh, perhaps uh, helping you understand the connection between blockchain technology and uh, journalism. Um, there are r several others who have raised their hand earlier, so maybe we can give the floor here. Yes. Thank you. Um, it's Eva Kaili. I'm a member of the European Parliament, uh, working on legislation for fake news and also blockchain. We don't like to call it fake news recently. We prefer misinformation because I, I will agree with uh, some of your speakers that um, it can mislead uh, legislation to ban content, which is exactly the opposite of what we want. We need more freedom of speech even if this um, uh, means that we have misinformation or not good quality of information. And I have to uh, make the um, distinction between what is uh, misinformation or a different perspective uh, than uh, hate speech and illegal content. So this is where we can make a clear definition. If it's not hate speech or illegal content, then you cannot ban it. Uh, there, there has been an effort, in, uh, especially in Germany, to, um, to give the power to the platforms that are carrying news, like Facebook and uh, maybe even Google, to have legal responsibility to ban content that is misinformation without explaining what misinformation is. And this is a bit uh, uh, worrying, especially to see this happening in Europe. Um, so one of the things that we're trying now, we are building up a unit in the European Parliament and working with the Commission in coordination to provide options when you have an article that is disputed to have directly connected, to make sure that an algorithm will show you different options of the same story and then you can decide but not ban content. So this is one of the solutions we've been working on to give more data to the citizens because we have a lot of data and it's not clear if the source is verified. And sometimes you can also have data, but the scientist can have one opinion and another scientist interpret it uh, in a different way. So we will provide them with all the data that we have. <clears throat> and on blockchain, if I may just add one thing, since I'm also working on the resolution, I'm drafting it now. So we're gonna give some direction on legislation, not on the technology, but the applications to make sure that citizens understand what is blockchain, what is not, because uh, there is also a lot of fraud and scams around the ICOs and the uses of blockchain. Actually, it, does not, it would not replace banks, but the, the intermediaries. So I would say that the most important thing that blockchain does is remove intermediaries or reduce the power of the intermediaries. And uh, of course, decentralization uh, so that you cannot take down the system or um, or your money, because it's, as you very well said, it's a copy that is uh, given to everybody, so it's difficult, you cannot take down the system. It doesn't belong to one person, unless it's a permissioned blockchain. So you can have blockchain that it is controlled, to make sure that this is also, we have some clear definitions. And um, one final thing, because you also said, what's the relation between fake news, misinformation, I would say again, and blockchain? 
The one thing that I can see can be useful if you have journalists here is that you can have, you can be paid directly for anything that you post without intermediary, so without the media, without the association. So this means you can survive if you have good articles. So you can make an exchange and be paid directly through the ads um, that are um, shown on the platforms. So whoever reads your, like YouTube, whoever sees your video or your uh, content, they directly give a small percentage of like a little bit of uh, a coin, a token to you. So this is just an, an example of how this could be useful. So this can give more independency to some uh, journalists. Uh, but uh, thank you, you have an excellent panel and you made the very clear distinction between uh, fake news and freedom of speech. That's why I don't, I don't like this word, fake news. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe there are other comments. Um, has anyone raised their hand and not spoken yet? Uh, okay. So, okay, you can take the floor and then we'll return back to the panel. So it's it's just really uh, a comment uh, about all these uh, sessions about uh, uh, fake news. Well, uh, I am uh, from Spain, from the Citizens Platform Against Islamophobia. So the issue in Spain, I am sorry because I am hearing a lot of free uh, freedom of speech, and uh, from my side, I, I don't know how to deal with that because uh, we have we really have uh, an amount of hate crimes and uh, it's really affecting uh, society and people are really believing all this misinformation, fake news. Sorry, I have to call it fake news because it is a lot of fake news. So, uh, and misinformation and propaganda. And so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, struggling to get a hold of how can freedom of speech be above all that, you know? Uh, feeling that all this uh, speech is already on the street, is already in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, have the floor. Thank you. My name is Arle Gerkes. I'm a Dutch senator. And I, uh, I completely agree with you, Yolanda. Um, the people here from the Netherlands, they might know that uh, my, my party, I'm from the Socialist Party, has been had to do with a lot of fake news in traditional media. Uh, we call that framing. It's a different word, but it's the same thing. The outcome is the same. They, you, they try to push you into to a, a corner to make sure that you don't gain that power at elections. So there's nothing new uh, under the sun. The skill is different. Uh, that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing, also in Spain, uh, uh, fake news is being used at the moment. I think that also gives an answer to the question why is there so much attention for this subject now on this uh, conference. We like to blame fake news for things, major things that happened in our country, Trump, of in our uh, world, Trump being elected, Brexit, Catalonia, and it's actually just an excuse for politicians not to look at what really happens. And we blame it on f fake news, but it's not the fake news that made that shift. Of course, uh, it is the propaganda who helped a little bit, but it's, it's stirred up something that was already there. It wasn't that there was no problem in Catalonia. There were a lot of problems in Catalonia, and this is the reason why, you know, at, at one point people didn't want to, to uh, keep it the way it is. Uh, uh, lastly, uh, I think, you know, then we come to the conclusion we have fake news. The scale is much bigger than the, the normal media that we have, which also has a lot of fake news or, or propaganda or framing or whatever you want to call it. So we're struggling with that and we're thinking about, I mean, we're here, we're talking about how can we decide if this news is real news or not. I, I personally believe that all politicians or all political parties should be transparent on how they were using the internet or targeting uh, people at Facebook to, to get their votes. Uh, but that's one side, but let's all be honest, it, it, the solutions that we are talking about here are solutions for highly educated people. We're all highly educated as we're sitting down here. And the majority of the people is just not highly educated and they just will tell you, well, I know it's true, it's, it, I, I read it on Facebook. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not optimistic in how we can solve this, uh, even with blockchain, but maybe, yeah. I, I wouldn't know a way out, let's be honest about that, yeah. Speaking of optimism, I already said we will not <laughs> produce solutions. <laughs> so, so this is merely a discussion and, and, and looking into it. Uh, I'll have to give the floor first. Perhaps Krishna to ha had a response and then we'll come back to you. 
uh, I, will I will directly add to your point because um, I'm also kind of critical and this is more of a uh, question for everyone to think about. Because when the internet was f first presented to us, it was this decentralized network that's going to revolutionize human interactions. And the way I see blockchain is it's an advancement over the internet and it's further uh, in increasing the impact and influence of decentralization. So what is essentially doing is it is taking away intermediaries and making the process more linear. But at the end of the day, people uh, are going to use it and blockchain and internet are nothing but technologies and tools. And as long as we continue to think about um, solutions with technology at the center, I don't think that's going to be useful because it should be people in the center uh, as the core. Uh, and then we have to think about solutions. And as she pointed out, um, ordinary people are going to use blockchain and there are so many misinformation uh, around blockchain itself and information uh, concerning the users as in who are the people using bitcoins and cryptocurrencies which make use of blockchain and the answer is more or less people who are trading on the dark market which is not always true because now it's being used by uh, more people in the public and there are more investments and there's more curiosity um, but at the same time and these are all the things that I feel need to be handled. Misinformation around blockchain, how to use blockchain, and how do we further um, encourage people to use newer technologies in the right way. Thank you, Thank you Krishna. I, for one, uh, don't trade on the black market, and I have Bitcoin, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Please. Um, you ask how many people in the room knew perfectly what blockchain was, and only five or six people can raise their hands. Personally, I had heard hundreds of explanations of what was blockchains, even at Cybos, the big interbank data show, and it is the first time I understand what it is. I assume that today, now, after you're speaking, the 100 hands which could be raised, but I have to warn all of you, and this is not a joke. <coughs> if you go on this way, being factual, informative, casual, open, uh, with question marks, et you will not make a career in this system, nor in any system. It, 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 this is at the core of, uh, of not fake news, but shallow news. It, Whichever expert speaks in this room or in whichever room of, and in whichever big organization will not say anything wrong. You can read his speech, one hour speech, there will be nothing wrong. In the UN system, you will have all the keywords of the SDGs without uh, omitting one. But the whole does not make sense. It is dead language, it is formalistic, it is liturgy, you say liturgy, catechism. it does not make, this is a real issue. But you are on the wrong track, you are trustful, you are intelligent people, open, speak truth, you will never make a career in any big organization. And even the lady from the uh, uh, Council of Europe, She's like you, and I fear for her future in her organization. <laughs> so that's one thing I wanted to say. The so second thing, I was very much interested in what you all said with so much freshness, uh, including, of course, the lady from South Africa, but I disagree with her on one count, and this count could interest you. In French language, there was one daily newspaper which was the voice of God. It's like the Times, London Times, it is Le Monde, it still exists. Once I heard someone say, from the day I read in Le Monde of Monday, an opinion by that great philosopher, which is challenged on Tuesday by that other grand uh, uh, famous philosopher, I would be interested in the opinion of my immediate neighbors. But worse, I am addict to old books. So in the past few years, I read some old books about Le Monde. And I realized at 70 that I had been, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, bluffed by a low quality paper full of scandal, full of lies, which people, journalists who were also revealed in books which were 
not read because it was again the uh, media establishment. And now I realize I that I have, have believed lies of the qu best quality paper for 50 years. And it took me 50 years to realize that what is considered in France as the voice of God is in fact a pitiful advertisement. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I mean, quite enlightening um, and also realistic. Uh, we do have uh, remote participants who would like to intervene. We'll give them a floor and then re return to the panel. This is on behalf of Chris Prince Udo Chukwe Nyoku, if I pronounce it uh, correctly, and otherwise I apologize. His comment is as following, and then a question. I quite agree with my colleague from the European Parliament. Yes, there is a big difference between hate speech, illegal content, and misinformation or false information. Misinformation in the online world is like the rumor we live with in the offline world. Though governments and others always frown at rumor peddling, rumor, rumor peddlers are still here with us. One chief way they have been handled is overlooking their rumors, not yielding to their distraction, and, that, and this has been working. And then the question, why is the online version attracting legislation that may negatively affect people's freedom or expression? Um, who would like to take that question? Um, the panel? Yes, Arda? Well, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's more of a statement than a question, and I think it's a good statement. But again, I believe that the reason why it's interesting to talk about fake news and not about the events happening is the reason why we're talking about it. I don't think it will come to legislation. I don't hope it will come to legislation, because I agree with the Hollanda that it might uh, affect the freedom of speech. But this, I think the reason why is it, it will distract us from what's really happening out there. Thank you. Uh, Yolanda? Um, hi. Hi again. <laughs> so unfortunately, I don't have a response directly to that, but I do have a comment per se. Um, I've been listening to the conversation around blockchain technologies, which is really great, but at the same time, I can't forget about at least my context of Africa, right? Um, as much as we're saying, you know, the people must use these technologies, I worry that access is still an issue to, the, to just basic technology in, in Africa. So how far are we willing to go in terms of, well, access to ICTs, but also, um, sort of digital education as how to use these things, because they might be there, but if people don't understand or don't know how to mm -hmm. use them, what is the point? Um, back to, the, to, to when you asked who knows blockchain, in a, in a room full of intellectuals, um, <laughs> if we may call ourselves that, only five, five people only really understood this. So when we talk about possible solutions, but people still have a very hazy understanding of the way forward, um, I sort of worry, you know, in terms of like, people in my context where we don't even have a hazy understanding what happens to those people. Um, furthermore, to the point around the bubble, I really agree with that and it really concerns me because, I mean, take account someone who's from, let's say, a rural setup, they have Facebook, they see this as news, they instantly believe it without verifying the facts. So the more I think about it and the more I listen, the more I worry and I'm tongue-tied because what really happens next. Um, and I do think education and digital literacy really has to play a bigger role. And that is literally like the most basic, not only exclusively to fake news, but just in terms of this whole internet governance and use of ICTs. So in a nutshell, what I'm really saying is, um, I still believe that you know freedom of expression should reign supreme. I still believe that um, there is a need to obviously verify information. And fake news isn't just only about what is true or not, but it's also about how facts are being presented. So the conversation is more nuanced um, than just fac facts or not. But I, I, I really worry in terms of the global south. You know, where do we stand with this conversation? And especially in, um, in a setting where we actually do need information, we, any information that we get, it is key because we use that to obviously advance our, uh, our hopes to have a fully functional democracies in many of our states. So um, the future looks very dim. But uh, at the same time, we're here to shape our digital futures. So I think we should probably take it um, a session at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. I'd like to also note that uh, focus on uh, developing countries is also useful since they are the next one billion internet users coming up. Uh, additionally, I mean, I may have said that I st uh, teach at Stockholm, but I'm originally, you can tell I'm not, uh, I don't look like a Scandinavian, <laughs> uh, but uh, I've been there for many years. I come from the Middle East uh, where there's a waging, raging war 
and, and particularly from Yemen, and I've seen firsthand how tremendously impactful uh, any form of abuse of media can be on people's lives. So it's a matter of life and death sometimes. So this is what we're talking about is really serious in many parts of the world. Let me go back to Nadia. I think she had an intervention. Sorry. So I'd like to comment on uh, what the gentleman here in front has said about, uh, you know, fearing for our jobs because of the manner in which we are approaching it through the, the very factual setting that we're taking. So one of the things that, uh, that, I w that is concerning is that we first need to understand what truth means in our society before we can understand what false is. So what here specifically I'm referring to is media landscapes. So for example, if you're looking at the north of Europe, which focuses primarily on um, uh, news is, what you can f what you can factually verify if this is has actually existed it's about reporting what there is and not focused on opinion where if you look at the south of europe there it's a very advocacy based so you you present your opinion so it's opinionated facts so this is what you believe in and this is what you then present as being the news and then we need to learn um, what other societies think about what truth is or what news is so then um, and then I study different different other media landscapes. So if you're looking at Africa, um, from what I understand, and then I, I hope that I'm being intervened if I'm getting it wrong, because then this is my understanding of one culture towards another. The media landscape in Africa is looking towards the, the sentiment of Ubuntu, of the, that ideology of togetherness. The truth then in that regard in journalism is about what is good for the people, what is going to ensure that the, the, the community um, succeeds. If we look at Russia, we look at the Ruski Mir, and the fundamental core of understanding of how Russian society then works is, at the end of the day, if you're in cold Siberia, the community needs to survive. So the leader is the person who can ensure that you survive the winter. So the entire concept of, of, uh, of when people were wondering why Putin was voted again, uh, a lot of the questions surrounded uh, around it there is the culture uh, connotations with uh, the, the, the Ruski Mir in which people believe that someone who knows how to survive the winter, whatever their decision is, is going to be the right decision for the people so they can ensure whatever happens, they will survive the winter be it by building that community and following that leader, regardless of what that person does, even sacrificing. So we need to focus more on um, micro-targeting. We've, we've spoken about um, about the global, so you fear because of the informed, but we really need to look at what are different cultures and societies doing, even with our own country. We need to look at the different uh, groups that are forming, and as m fake news targets through micro-targeting, we also need to do that and strengthen our local and regional journalism. Thank you, Nadia, for thought-provoking uh, comments. Uh, we have inter interventions from remote participants. Well, but like my, my own oh, yeah. put inputs. <laughs> yeah, you're um, not a remote participant, uh, but go thank ahead. You. <laughs> uh, my name is Walter Natris. I was asked to be the remote moderator, but here in the discussion, I would like to make two comments and bring it back to the question I'll start with. You can with. flip closer to the mic, please. The, the question to start with is how can blockchain actually be used to, to, to mend this? First comment, I think the stakes for journalism are up these days. We depend on them more than ever, and it's more difficult for them to, to, to do their job, it seems. I'll give one example. I think there was a 30-year-long research from Germany saying the Western Europe is using between 70 and 80, 70 and 80 percent of insects in our environment. They put it on the 8 o'clock news, which is watched by 2 to 3 million people of 70 million people a day. And they gave more attention to one farmer saying, oh, in my, in my farm, we have a lot of insects and my bees are doing very well. So what was the message coming off from 30-year research compared to five-minute talk by one farmer saying things are well? So that is one. How do journalists go present news in the way that people really understand what is going on and what the problem is? is instead of interviewing one person. The other one is, and I'm coming back to Arda's comment, about disruption or, or disruption of societies. And yes, things are going very wrong, 
but when foreign entities are able through bots on Facebook and bots on Twitter, etc., to influence a, a discussion that may not be the right th uh, answer to the people's problems, then societies may be disrupted. And But how do we filter it? Yes, we have to have freedom of speech, because that's the, the inherent part of our society, the Western democracies. But how do we also protect ourselves from others that do harm? And can blockchain actually assist in getting the right sort of messages out? And yes, I agree with you, traditional newspapers may also have been pro uh, promotions for, for p political views. I certainly believe that, but how do we get messages across that really verify what the truth is? And that's where I also mean the stakes for journalists are up, because they are the ones that can tell us what is happening. And whatever that outcome is, is that's the sort of thing we need to do. And if blockchain can help and assist with that, then I need to, it's time to figure out how we do that. Thank you very much. I mean, this is a very good call back to this uh, main subject of how b blockchains can, or if they can help uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, elim not eliminating, but confronting fake news. Uh, let me bring in here from uh, some methodological perspective, maybe as an academic, I think met methodologically sometimes, uh, I even if you, really, uh, if you really do want to have any form of technology, not only blockchain, any form of technology that you can think of, support in solving a problem, you need to look into the characteristics of the technology that is connected directly to solutions to the problem. So blockchain as a whole has a, a numerous number of characteristics Many of them may not have any connection to fake news or media and journalism at all, but some of them could if you think of them in certain ways. So, for example, the idea of decentralization. Is it helpful to re remedy uh, fake news or deal with fake news? The other aspect of uh, blockchains that is connected, may be connected, is the fact that, uh, that the blockchains are generally uh, tamper-proof, meaning that once it's on the ledger, it cannot be uh, modified. So information that's put on uh, the uh, database that's on a blockchain uh, cannot be altered. Immutability, in other words. So is that a helpful thing for uh, journalism, or is, is it not? So these are questions I'm still posing. I mean, because we should always understand that technology sometimes cannot necessarily be directly an, a solution, but uh, it can be adapted or it can be transformed so that it can, custom, in a customized way, support some of the uh, um, ambitions of improving what we have. Uh, we do have comments earlier that we have. Please uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, um, Martin Fischer um, from the uh, iRights IGF Academy. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a technology problem. Um, I mean, I think there's good practice in technology, like. Uh, um, a lot of uh, quality newspapers started now to turn off the comment section because the comments actually don't bet, uh, add any, ben any benefit to the debate. Um, and I think that helps a lot. Uh, what I think, however, is that it's a quite technology, uh, uh, a quite societal problem. And I wanted to come back what the lady on the panel on, on the side over there said earlier. I didn't hear what your uh, party was uh, that you come from, but when you frame the so-called mainstream media as uh, uh, being fake news for framing you. I, I wonder if you're spreading fake news yourself. I don't think that framing is a, a good word to throw in the mix here. Uh, I think framing is for once a psychological uh, process that we all do when we put things into perspective. And for second, it's a rhetorical uh, uh, mean that we all apply in our language. So throwing that in the mix, using that for political gain, and we see that a lot currently, I think that greatly contributes to the societal problem that we have with fake news. So, Arda, since you've been put on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I think the difference is, I mean, the word framing is what we use in my country. It might uh, give another uh, um, uh, explanation in your country. But what I meant to say about fake news, I mean, and I think we talked about, about this uh, already, that there are many ways in, in how you can see fake news. Uh, I have really uh, uh, seen at, maybe, well, that's not the quality newspaper, that's what we know in my country, but um, I mean, really lies being spread, things that actually were really not true about my party. And I really know, I, 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 I know it happens too from other newspapers on other parties. I mean, uh, just the whole thing is that we, at this point, we always, uh, uh, we, 
there's nothing new about news being spread that's not correct. It happens. It happens with big newspapers. It happens now on the internet. The problem now is it's, the skill is so big, and that's what I want to come back to. What, what Wout says, you know, if one uh, he says it's I'm afraid, you know, if other countries start spreading fake news in my country, influencing the democratic process, I'm most probably I, uh, the, the the same country will do. Some, the same, use the same technique. So in the end, and, and I think this is what worries me, we don't know what's real anymore. So all the information we get, we cannot know, is it real, is it not real, what's the right information? And this, and this is the thing that, that I worry about, the skill that's happening now, means that our democratic process is in danger. And I don't know how to solve this, but this is what I think that happens. It looks like time is running out quickly. We have another four or five minutes. Uh, there are, uh, there's one intervention from remote participants. We'll give that, and then uh, we'll have uh, final thoughts from the panel. This is again from Chris Prince Oduchupu Nyoku. And he said, there is another side to this discussion. Some governments often define information as mis or false information wh when they are true, because they want not anybody to know the truth. Uh, this, this, is a, this is common when they have things to hide. Their plans are not in the interest of their people and they suspect there will be objections and uprising and they don't want objections. The question is then, when is actually a piece of information false or misrepre misrepresentative? How do we define misinformation to accommodate the scenario I described here? So uh, since this is a very big question, <laughs> it cannot be answered right now, I'd leave that for thought later. But we'll give a final thought from the, the main panelists, and this would be one minute max, please. Thank you. So what I see that we face today is we have an ecosystem of fake news. Uh, we, we spoke a little bit about fake science or science uh, or biased science, about biased um, uh, uh, opinions, opinions presented as facts, and uh, the, although that we haven't been able to find particular solutions, there have been initiatives that are working towards these. For, insert, for, uh, for example, journalists are looking at Wiki Tribune, so uh, verified journalists from the entire world are coming together to create like a Wikipedia version of, 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 of actual fact, source verified news. Uh, you as an individual can sign up to Wiki Tribune, and um, if you have a, a good background, they, uh, they um, give you a guide on how to contribute to online journalism and engage with this. On the governmental side, the European Union is doing an EU versus disinformation campaign. Uh, this is a great campaign to really understand uh, about um, the source verification fact checking uh, site that governments are engaging in. and. Uh, whether or not they're taking the right approach, that's something to, to, to look into. <coughs> Civil society, yesterday we saw Stop Fake for one of the panels. Uh, we also have Full Fact and Fact Check that are engaging with this. So we are, we are working from a, um, from, a, from a, you know, not top down, but from bottoms up approach, and we really should focus on this. Uh, just one quick comment about the framing and one uh, about <clears throat> the concept of framing is something that we talk a lot in business and in communications and something that I, as a, from coming from a communications background, is scared to address. So I'm very happy that this was actually raised in the discussion. It hasn't been raised in, in political or technological settings, but perhaps we should do. And this, is, as a multi-stakeholders forum, is then an excellent opportunity to start engaging on this topic. Thank you. Um, so wh what I feel is we are at a point um, when it comes to block blockchain in general, I mean, uh, blockchain in 2017 kind of mirrors uh, the internet in the 1990s. We have a lot of curiosity. Uh, people uh, are willing to explore what it can do and what it can't. Um, and so while I'm optimistic uh, that it can solve a lot of issues, including fake news, um, I'm pessimistic about how people over a period of time uh, would tend to use this and misuse it. So I feel what we need is a stronger value system, uh, norms, and evolution of institutions to make this um, renew, um, some technology that we can uh, um, rely on. Um, very briefly, um, it has been a very interesting uh, panel discussion, and I think we all can live here, leave here with a food for thought. But in terms of fake news, um, I still say we still have a long way to go, and 
I'm still not convinced with blockchain, but maybe because I'm part of the few that don't really understand it. Uh, thank you all. Yeah, i just like to repeat a, th a thing that Yolanda said and which uh, uh, haven't been emphasized enough, and that's education. Digital education is really key here. And uh, also, if we start using blockchain or any other technique, people need to know what's happening out there so they can make their own, up on their own mind, so yeah. Thank you everyone for making it this far and we've just exceeded our time. I'd like to give a round of applause to the panelists and to the audience for a great session. Thank you.